the following interview was conducted with Wayne Kime for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, no, uh, November the 16th, 2007, and the at uh, Stewart Center, the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you. Tell, and also sitting in is his wife Joyce and Valerie Yazoo, the Oral History, or the Diversity Fellow. Okay, go ahead. Um, welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Okay. I was born in Ithaca, New York, while my father was a graduate student at Cornell University. And uh, he was on, on leave okay. back and forth from, uh, he had a full-time job at the University of Nebraska, and he just went back and forth from Nebraska to Cornell whenever he could get a leave of absence. And so I was six months old then when my family moved back to to Lincoln, Nebraska. So that's where I grew up in Lincoln. And grad and went through the public school system there. How large was the town at that oh, time? Oh, about 80,000, I think. Something like that. And uh, then, um, now I have my wife with me and she's going to help me remember things because I, she's got a better memory than I do because it was a long time ago that I'm, when we moved from Ithaca, New York to Lincoln, Nebraska, that was 84 years ago. Or, yeah, okay. And so then I grew up in Lincoln and then I graduated from the University of Nebraska. And What was your major? My major was uh, agronomy and mathematics. I had a double major. I had spent some time in the Army, three years in the U.S. Army during World War II, but I was fortunate in that the Army uh, sent me to college most of the time, some of the time. And uh, so then shortly after I, I graduated in uh, 1947 from the University of Nebraska, I married my bride, who sits beside me here. Sixty years ago this summer, we were married. And then, uh, do you want me to continue on? Yeah, well, tell us what college that was. Oh, well, life. I was, I was. Uh, what was it like in It was. Uh, it was during the, during it was, the war. No, it was after. After we, the war. We, I got out of the service in 46. The war ended in 45. and. And then, uh, uh, oh, I, I think it's typical college for those days. University of Nebraska is an interesting situation in that it has separate campuses. The, the so-called ag campus is, is about three miles from the downtown campus. And so we were busy going back and forth from one campus to the other. Uh, then, what else can I say about the university? It was a. Did you live on campus? No, oh. my my dad was on the faculty at the University of Nebraska, so when I got back from the service, uh, see, I had part of my education before the military, and then I finished up afterwards, and I had only a year, a little more than a year to finish, and so I stayed at home because my my parents' home was just a block, just a block south of the ag campus. And then that's when I met Joyce. And uh, was she a student there at that? She time? was a student there, and we graduated the same time. And even though we were in different colleges, they let us walk down the aisle together to get our diplomas. You remember that? Mm -hmm. What was what was her major? What school was she in? Psychology. I she was in arts and sciences. In those days, they called it arts and science. may still call it College of Arts and Science. And uh, she was a psychology major. She's been using her psychology on me ever since. <laughs> and what was the career path after that? Tell us a little bit about what you did well, after, after you graduated. Okay, I, I decided to go to graduate school, and so I went to Cordell University, where my dad had gone in the same department that he went 20-some years later, and, uh, and got a master's and a PhD in plant breeding and genetics. And uh, so it was a, uh, I've often thought about it, 
we always said our, our my dad had very little influence on on my career, but I, I imagine I he did have a lot of it because I took my first course in genetics at the University of Nebraska from him. He that's what he taught. How does it be? How does it be to be in a class with you? Well, I tell you, I worked harder in that class than I ever worked before because I knew I was supposed to get an A, and <clears throat> and in fact, I think I let other courses slide a little bit so that I could be sure to get an A in that course, <laughs> and did. That's interesting. <clears throat> and by the way, before I forget it, then when I taught genetics here at Purdue, my son, our son, went through my course and took genetics with me. And he said the same thing. That he must have heard you say that. It, it, was, it was pressure, pressure, pressure. And of course, all of his buddies gave him a bad time about taking a course with me, you know. And uh, but getting an A. And he got his A. He had to. He had to work to get it. And I think he let other things slide. What was it like at Cornell at the, in those days? At that time, was the campus like? Well, it. Of course, I have been there except to visit about twice in in all those years but it's a very uh, elegant place and the buildings are older and a lot of them are old there's a lot of new ones too but they have lots of money there and uh, their endowment is very high and and uh, it by the way the uh, uh, Cornell University is the land-grant university for New York State but curiously enough not a hundred percent of it Part of it is, and part of it isn't. It's quasi, right. And, uh, but uh, it was a great university, and I, I was not interested in sa staying back in the East when I, when we finished, because I, well, there, I have nothing against the East, but I just, I'm a Midwesterner, and I just liked it out this way. And so well, then when you finished, what, tell us what to do. Then yeah. when we finished there, and, uh, then uh, I took my first job at Iowa State University in Ames, and uh, we were there, and we loved Ames. It was a great town, it's a small town. Uh, for a college town, it's very small. And, but the university is very, very, especially in my area, very strong. And we've been lucky in all of our career to be at places where the, the university was strong in my field. Of, I ended up being what I call plant breeding and genetics. So we stayed at Ames, Iowa three and a half years and then took a job at Purdue University. How did, how did that come about? Well, uh, we didn't have the old uh, affirmative action equal opportunity and so the, my, the boss here, Dr. J.B. Peterson, was a very good friend of the boss at Iowa State, Wendell Pagonier and the genetics job here turned up and so uh, when my boss at Iowa State heard about it and they were old buddies he called up and, and uh, talked to JB about my coming here and so that's the way it happened pretty soon we were back here interviewing for a job and that was 19 55. Okay, what was the housing and, and were you able to find, what was it like? Here it was bad. <laughs> it was very difficult and we lived in, um, well I'm not sure you'd call it temporary housing, but we lived out on David, no, David Ross Road, mm -hmm. on David Ross Road. out. It was experimental housing. I see, yeah, it was out there by the big tower, water tower, and the houses, uh, oh we didn't suffer any but it was uh they were temporary houses that were had been built i think for that time or, right yeah and i've heard that from other people mm -hmm. around that era yeah. too weren't they built by the uh national homes national homes yes. some of them and it was uh, on a hill remember for a while we lived at the bottom of the hill yeah. and when, when it yeah. rained the water came down and we had a geyser in our kitchen yeah it was <laughs> quite a deal through the floor did but you have had you have children at that time yes we had uh we had two, Three, two. Two then, and then our youngest was born. Born. While okay. we were there. Okay. In the yeah, house. that's right. Mm -hmm. One child was born in, in Ithaca, New York, and one was born in Ames, Iowa, and then one was born in Lafayette over in Home, home Hospital, they call it. Okay. Yeah, that's well, tell us how when you got started, what, uh, and I know I want to ask you about Peterson because he was the head for a long time. That's right. Time. 
all the time that you were here. Yeah, right. Well, do you want to know how, why I got here, why? Yeah. The uh, genetics course, the introductory genetics course that was required of a lot of students, they, are, they had three separate courses taught. One was in biology, one was in animal science, and one was in poultry. They had poultry department in those days. And uh, R.B. Stewart actually had quite a bit to do about this, but he said that's not very efficient to have three separate courses. And so they decided that they really ought to have just one course. And naturally, each one of those three departments wanted to teach this course. And R.B. was there, according to what I, I wasn't there, and R.B. said uh, to the people, uh, since each one of them wanted it, to solve the problem, he turned to J.B. Peterson and said, is there any reason that agronomy can't teach a beginning genetics course? And uh, uh, Dr. Peterson was kind of taken back by it all because they had never taught that course. And he, but he was a very, oh, tremendous man. He said, sure, we can do it without any hesitation. And, and so that's the way it worked out. And so when we got here. This had taken place before you came, this discussion. Yes, with her. that's right. And when we got here in January of 1956, we, uh, so I was developing then a new course. And I had, oh, I had good cooperation from the various people involved, I remember. Uh, and there was no animosity. And in fact, some of them were probably, I think, kind of glad to get rid of the course because it was hard work because we had large enrollments. And uh, so then I took over. And when I got here, the life science building was just half done. So the west wing was there and the east wing was not here, there. And so we, my office was temporarily in the in the West Wing, and I remember Dr. Peterson told the people around here, well, he couldn't do it unless they gave him more space. And so uh, my office and labs were in the East Wing of the Plant Science, Life Science Building, and, uh, and that was the only part of agronomy that was in the East Wing. And so we had new facilities, and, and uh, we started out in as I said, January 56, and, and then the course was successful, and then we got bigger and bigger and bigger as far as enrollment is concerned, and, but uh, that's kind of the... How you got started. How is I got the building st still under, constru we're under yeah. construction at the time you came here, so just one wing was finished? One wing was finished, mm -hmm. and, they, and then they built the second w wing when, when we were teaching, and, so I was teaching in, in temporary quarters until that building was finished. So then I had new offices, new, and it was very good. And they and they did the right thing. It wasn't just a matter of going into the to the facilities and without any help. And so they they lined up so that I had one graduate teaching assistant at all times, and so, sometimes two, as as it built. As the uh, or, and then our course, it was called Agronomy 430 in those days. That was um, a required course for many students. And my largest uh, student enrollment was pre vets. They were, one time I calculated that 42% of my students were pre vets. And that was a fun experience because uh, they. Everybody that's a pre vet wants to be a veterinarian. And so you don't have to worry about them studying and getting working toward good grades. So it was easy. They, and my students were excellent students. And, uh, and, uh, this was before the vet school started, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Because well, that's 59, didn't it, when it opened? Uh, yeah, I remember when it opened. And in fact, you'll be interested that the very first year that the vet school opened, they didn't have a full quorum of students. They had, they, they were, I think, I'm guessing now, but I think in those days, 60 was a class, and I think they had 52 or something like that, because it was new, brand new, and they, and they really started before they were ready to start, I think, 
but it was a it was an interesting experience. So then, so I then, in those years I was here, I had the first group of veterinarians, the older veterinarians here in the state, that graduated from Purdue, were my students. That's, if before the school opened, did you have pre-vet or not? Uh, I don't think so. Because there was no vet. That's the only there vet was school no in vet, the state. No, still, no. is this one? Yeah, and I remember the man, the first uh, dean of the vet school. Was that Erskine Morris? No, I knew we knew him quite well. Okay. But there was another one before him. Uh, in fact, I don't want to be uh, pessimistic, but the first veterinary dean died of some sort of a of a animal disease. There was one. He was not there too long or something. Yes. I remember. It, the school was going to be celebrating their anniversary in 09. Oh, really? Right, yeah. Yeah, that, so, uh, that I've always said, having the vet students in class uh, helped keep the level of the course up because, and I used to have some students complain that weren't a vet student because they said the level of the course was too high for the average student. But the vet students, now they weren't all outstanding. And uh, one time the dean told me that they looked very carefully at the grades that the, the pre-vets got in my class because they knew that we were having a, a good rigid class. And if they got an A, and if they didn't get an A in my class, well then they looked what were the students like? Did you interact? They were most of them were from overall and the students. Oh, they here? were. I always had good students here. I think, and uh, people wouldn't believe me sometimes when I, you know, talk about how qualified the students were, and they were. Uh, well, a lot of it, you know, is motivation. They were motivated because they wanted to get into vet school. That's the easiest motivation there is, and. Uh, but it was a, it was a fun experience, and we stayed here 19 and a half years. And well, you, did you continue with your research while you're here as well? Yes, speaking? but yes, except that uh, I want to make sure to emphasize that my department head here was J. B. Peterson. Mm -hmm. J. B. Peterson uh, came from Iowa State, and he was a teacher there. He did research too, but he was a teacher, and he believed in. He, he didn't believe in any 50-50 appointments. And so my appointment here at Purdue was 80% teaching, 20% research. And and I doubt if there were very many people as fortunate as I that had a, a department head that was so enthusiastic about teaching. And more than once when I would get enthusiastic about expanding my research, he told me, he told me that, look, he says, I can find Ten good researchers for every good teacher I can find. So get back down there and teach your genetics course, and uh, I enjoyed that. I think I had seven thousand students in the twenty years we were here, nineteen and a half years. Yeah. But I just wanted to say I've been thinking a little bit about Dr. Peterson. He <clears throat> he he backed me from the beginning, and I got promoted in the minimum amount of time. Uh, on basis of my teaching, and that's kind of unheard of in this day and age. Uh, but but it's I, key to the university teaching. That's teaching right. Here well, that's what I've said, and my career has been th that same way. Uh -huh. And uh, so I've I've always been more than half, usually seventy-five or eighty percent teaching, uh, wherever I've been. And uh, but Dr. Peterson was was. Uh, remarkable man and he had a remarkable wife Beth and they had uh, they had more uh, spree corps in the department than you can imagine when we were in JB Peterson's house and Beth Peterson played the piano by ear any tune any key you wanted and everybody was singing and it was a unusual experience I think to be with him and with them so, uh, <clears throat> but I also wanted to ask you. You mentioned about R.V. Stewart and the T.I.A. and Kraft. Yes. <clears throat> you mentioned this to me on the phone. Okay. <clears throat> I had been here just a year, I think, and a notice came around that 
a meeting was being held in the in the uh, M Elliott Hall of Music and expected everybody to be there. Well, that kind of a notice. That's a huge facility. Yes, it is, and and usually, you know, we're going to have a seminar today, and then you have to decide whether you think it's worth your time to go to a seminar. But the way this was worded and everything, everybody, what's going on? What's going on? <coughs> and so this was sent to the faculty. Yes, and I think the administration, department heads, and everybody were. And so I remember walking over to the student center with Ralph Davis, who was one of my colleagues, and in the department. I said, what's going on? He said, I have the slightest idea. But he, and, we, and never did we ever have meetings in the Elliott Hall. That's a big place. And we got over there <clears throat> and R.B. Stewart uh, said, he got up and he said, I have an idea that I want to share with you people. And that is um, having to do with your uh, retirement, TIA and CREP. The way it was before this meeting, uh, the university put 10% into the to the uh, retirement fund and the individual put in 5% and he said w I have an idea and of course the 5% was taxable because it was part of your salary and so he said I have an idea that I want to share with you he said what would you think if the university picked up all 15% of that and you didn't pay into it 5% well of course, everybody was thrilled to death with that idea. He said, well, we were thinking, <clears throat> we were thinking about giving everybody a 5% raise anyway, so it just sounded like good business. And everybody was thrilled to death. And so my TIA and CREF a retirement that I get now, except for the first year, all of it was paid by the university. I never, I never had to put anything more in it. Of course, it stopped as far as putting into it when I left Purdue. Sure. When we got out to Colorado State, why then there was no more TIA and, yeah, let's see. No, no. They had uh, a different retirement. Colorado had their own retirement oh, system, yeah, okay. which was not as good as TIA mm -hmm. and CREF. Where, where did you move after the apartment? Where, let's where you see. Living? Did you where buy did a house? You? We built a house out on Blackhawk Lane, you know where that is? Yes, right. And, uh -huh. uh, and we, Built it in. Uh, let's see. Fifty six. No, fifty eight. I don't know. Some, but it was a. Uh, we were lucky in that. Uh, her brother's an architect, and he designed the house. And uh, so the house is still there. Whenever we come to town, we drive out, drive around, look sure. at it. Um, did you go to any of the athletic events? The athletics? All of them. In those days, I was. We went to all the football games, and all the basketball games. <clears throat> Curiously enough, now, I guess it comes with old age. I just don't have the enthusiasm anymore for. The uh, president Hovde was president when you were here. Yes. Did you have any interactions with him? Or yes. Good. Uh, he he was a good man. Uh, I think people were kind of awed by him. Uh, he got he got a PhD at Oxford or somewhere in England. Right, and he had the whole regalia for commencement. Yes, and he wore he wore his round right. cap, and he was kind of a dis very distinguished man, and he was very friendly if if you had reason to talk to him, but I didn't go up and say, Fred, how are you? You know, <clears throat> uh, but but uh, I always felt he was a good man, and uh, we. <coughs> And they always had a, a president's reception over on Ninth Street or somewhere the, over there. Where the house was at yeah, that time. Yeah, and we were always invited in one Sunday of year, wasn't it, that we uh, would go over there and see a lot of the, the people. And so, you know, yeah, President Hobby was a, I think of it. In fact, I can say this, that I think the administration <coughs> at Purdue was considerably better than the average. They were just outstanding people. And uh, my dean while I was here was Earl Butts, as you know, is still He's alive. Still alive. Still right. alive, and and uh, I could spend an hour just telling stories about Earl Butts. But you want to share one or two that come to mind? Uh, yeah. Which one? <laughs> which, 
It's your call. One time, <clears throat> he and I were sitting at a bag banquet, and uh, our wives weren't with us. And Bud says, uh, Wayne, I hear you're a pretty good teacher. And I said, where did you hear that? And he said, well, that's what I heard. That's what I found out. And I said, well, how do you find that out? He said, well, I have a little gimmick. <clears throat> he, when students come in to uh, get their Alpha Zeta paddles signed, uh, you know what Alpha Zeta is, an honorary. And he says, <clears throat> I ask them a few questions before I'll sign it. The first question he says is, <clears throat> who are the best teachers you've had since you've been here? Oh, sir, they're all good, you know. And he said, you didn't understand me, lad. He said, I ask you for three names of the best teachers that you had. <clears throat> and he wouldn't sign it or let them out of his office until he got three names. And finally, the students would come up with three names. Then they'd think they were off the hook. And then he'd say, all right, now I want to know the three poorest teachers you've had since you've been here. And of course, oh, nobody wants to say that they're teachers. And but he was, as you know, a kind of a hard-nosed man. And he said, you didn't understand me, lad. He says, I want to know who were the three poorest students. And he wouldn't let them out of his office until he got three names. And he says, you know, it's amazing how consistent the three best ones and the three poorest ones were. And he says, you were always in that top category. <clears throat> and uh, That's so nice. I always remembered that. He, 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 it turned out he was a real good friend of ours while we were here, and Mrs. Uh, yeah, Butts and Joyce were good friends. And, and when Earl Butts first came back from Washington, D.C., being Secretary of Agriculture, I had never met him. So I said, uh, how are you, Dr. Butts or Dean Butts? And he put out my hands. He tapped me on the chest, and he says, my name is Earl, and don't forget it. And nobody ever, I don't know anybody then that ever called him Dean Butts. So it's always Earl, 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 and and he was a he was a different kind of dean, and but uh, a good one I felt for at least for Purdue he was he was really good, mm -hmm. and we, to have somebody with the kind of professional stature that he had was good for Purdue also. Sure. Oh, we'll tell you one more story about it. We we're, we're talking about this. When Earl Butts came back from Washington, he said, it's a great place, this Purdue University. He said, I just am so happy to get back on the same board again with Butts, Bottom, and Outhouse. There were Butts. Bottom was a professor in ag economics, and Outhouse was a professor in animal science. So he liked to talk about the board, sitting on the board, Butts, Bottom, and Outhouse. <laughs> that was Earl Butts. That you. sounds like him, right? Yeah. Did you serve on any of the committees in the, the Senate at all when you were here? Yes. Well, yeah. I was. A, I was the. What do they call it? Faculty Council. Yeah, I was yeah, on there that. There was a different name or something of yeah, that sort. I, you know. I don't remember any specific duties, but I do remember uh, coming over. Wasn't it over in this building? It might have been in Stewart. Maybe they met. And, uh, but I enjoyed it. And oh, I served, I served, they had what they call the Ag Staff Christmas Party. I doubt if they have it anymore, but it was a, a Christmas party for the Ag College, and, and, uh, and they always had a, what would you call it, mimic the, not mimic the dean, they kind of. A roast or something? A roast, that's the word I'm, a roast. And I remember one year the roast was for Earl Butts. And it was uh, promoting milk, not coffee. And so people in their offices would, when they knew Butts was coming to their office, they'd hide their coffee pot under their desk somewhere and get out the milk bottle because Earl was Mr. A, you know. And it, and uh, so we, we we put that on, and and I get well, I got to be the chairman of that program committee, and then. Chairman of the overall Ag Staff Christmas Party. There were, I don't know how many people came. I'd guess a thousand. What were some of your fondest memories that you don't share with? With Purdue? With, yeah. And thinking, oh, thinking my. back, anything comes to mind? Well, one thing is that our children grew up here, and uh, 
two yeah. out of the three graduated in here, and uh, oh, our son was on the crew, and so we followed him all over Marietta, Ohio, and wherever they went, and that was fun. And uh, then we got uh, one thing that happened here that I was very appreciative is they were good about giving you sabbatical leaves. And so in the 20 years we were here, had two sabbatical leaves. And the first one was to um, Sweden, and the second one was to Colorado State University. And uh, I always, and Dr. Peterson was gung-ho for sabbatical leaves. Uh, as long as you would find the person would find the replacement for while you were gone. He got tired of looking for people when somebody said, I'm going to take a sabbatical leave. Do I have permission? Yes, you have permission. And then they take off, and then Dr. Peterson was left high and dry with nobody to take the course. So I had to line up people to take my place while I was gone. But it was a, a oh, there was one other thing. They didn't call it a sabbatical leave. But in 1960, um, well, actually, it was 59, I ran into a former colleague of mine, graduate student colleague, who taught genetics at the University of Hawaii on the Manoa campus. And uh, I was really quite joking when I said, hey, you must have it rough over there. And, uh, and uh, so, long, make a long story short, uh, I suggested that we trade jobs, that I go to Hawaii and teach summer school over there, and that he come to Purdue and take my job. And I was, the guy, oh, I came back and I told Dr. Peterson about this, and he said, I think that sounds like a good idea. I thought he'd tell me, you lost your mind, you know. <laughs> and so he helped me get to, sw to Hawaii, and the guy came over here and he lived in our house and drove our car and we went to uh, Hawaii and lived in his house and drove his car and it was a fantastic experience. It's, uh, we've always remembered that, that stay in Hawaii and uh, so that was, I guess there's no reason to dwell on that one, but that was really the first time we, and, and we, when we got to Hawaii, that was uh, 1960, and that was just the year after Hawaii was named a state, 1959. Hawaii was a state, and so we, uh, we, and we had some interesting experiences. Um, I remember when the first uh, Japanese warship came into the harbor, peacetime. Then there was still a lot of animosity about uh, that. wasn't easy to take accept them. But uh, we had a great time over there, and, and the, I remember that I had three courses to teach over there in the summer, and I was busy, busy. I didn't have time to go to the beach or anything, and uh, I call up over here, and and I'd say, uh, I'd like to talk to Jimmy Bob Smith. That was his name, not James Robert. He was an Oklahoma boy, and he was Jimmy Bob Smith. And they'd say, well, he's out on the golf course. And I said, golf course? Well, it turns out that he taught my summer school class here to eight or ten students. And I was over there teaching three classes, each 30 each or something like that. And so I I've never, uh, he, oh, he thought it was a great idea to, to be over here. So it was. It was a nice experience. Yeah, it was a nice experience. Yeah. And then, as a matter of fact, our son lives in Hawaii now. Has been over there for 30 years, and uh, oh, it gives you a place to go to. We go every year. We've been there every year for 30 years, and uh, and uh, it's fun to go there. And we know all the islands reasonably well, and so it's. And then, when did you leave Purdue? Then we left Purdue in '75. Okay, and you Nin went to 1975. Went to Colorado State as department head of agronomy. Is that in Fort Collins? Yes. Okay. And then that's the land grant University of of uh, Colorado, and it's very similar to Purdue, except it's not as big. 
We're much smaller than Purdue. Well, what's the enrollment size? Oh, there? gee. We Seven. have about 40,000. Oh, well, enrollment. we're down to. It's about 25. Yeah, I'd say 25. I, I retired 15 years ago, so, so I don't. Uh, but you keep an office there? Yes, well, yeah, they let me. I wrote a history of the department and with some other guys, and they, uh, so they let me keep my office. Yeah, it's been a good experience out there. We, we miss Purdue. Every once in a while I say, oh, I miss Purdue. And, uh, but uh, it's a younger college and university. But uh, when we compare the climates of Colorado and Indiana, we're not about to come back. <laughs> Anything in closing? Any special favorite comments you'd like to make oh. that you can think of? We're always thrilled to come back to Purdue when we Especially work. Especially for the centennial, which is yes, the that's right, that's right. right. And uh, we, uh, but we see, but we bought a farm out north of West Lafayette in nineteen, the first part of it in nineteen sixty two, and that gives us an excuse to come back, and we always do come back with great enthusiasm. Look forward to it, and I think we've been back every summer. I feel a little bit like Purdue is where my career took place. Uh, I was 32 when I got here and I was 52 when I left. And also when you're a, a department head, uh, uh, sometimes you wonder about your, I used to joke that half the people thought I was doing a good job out there and half of them thought I was doing a poor job. And so, uh, but we have still have lots and lots of friends here. And people who were here when we were here, and uh, and we see Bill McPhee regularly because his daughter lives in Colorado, and so they come out there. And so when we come here, he's going to be honored. I hear today. Oh, that's it's right. It's some sort of a. That's nice. So uh, it's a it's a, a great place here. Well, we're just really, really pleased that we were able to arrange this. It's been very. Thank nice. you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>